Hi, good evening. I'm Dr. Philip McMillan. Thank you for joining me as we focus on what appears to be another circulation of Omicron variants across the Western world in highly vaccinated regions. There needs to be a recognition that COVID reinfections are not just mild. They have quite serious consequences. And so this is actually a review of a presentation that I did a number of months ago, and this was the slow kill of COVID reinfection, where I looked at a particular paper, and this paper was from 2022, which I'll come back to in a minute, looking at the outcomes associated with SARS-CoV-2 reinfection. Now, it was done from 2022, but the implications are still quite relevant. This video had over 250,000 views, so it resonates with people because they're seeing the implications around them. The design apologies with regards to this snake. Some people don't like it, but it is designed specifically to hold your attention and reflect on the seriousness as to what we are facing. In the same way, this is not over. I think it is critical for us to acknowledge that there is a problem. There is no one who can tell me that at the beginning of the pandemic, they imagined that we would be having round upon round of infection and variant just going on and on. Some people try and put this as endemic. This is endemic circulation of the virus. This is not endemic. This is way beyond anything we have ever seen before. The numbers of people who are infected are very high. It's just that nobody's testing. It's, so, it's suddenly now inconvenient to look at the numbers and to correlate it with regards to deaths and the outcomes because the actions have already been taken. So for those people who thought this was about health, if it's about health, you would be very concerned about reinfection. No, this is about politics. This is about finance. And in order to find solutions, we have to keep asking hard questions. So before I start, I'd just like to remind everyone to join us on our health journey. There is going to a link in the description where you will see to join our Vision Med newsletter. Uh, this one is about the global rise in penile cancer. Previously, we've covered Alzheimer's, we're looking at immune responses, beautiful imagery in conjunction with Lumientia. So um, we hope that you join us. It's free and you can just click on the link and go to our page to join us in that process. Additionally, coming up on the 18th of July is a presentation with regards to STORM. And STORM is what I describe as a spike-triggered autoimmune response mechanism. This is an acronym that I've created, and this is what I'll be trying to explain and tease out the science around what it is that I think is happening. And this is largely going to be around why we're seeing mortality around reinfections. And so if you want to join, the link is there. I think the free tickets have been used up at the moment, but please click on the link. And at that point, I'll try and break down some of the science and try and see if we can figure out ways that the population can be protected for those who are interested in health. So coming back to this question of reinfection, as I said in the past few days, and Gert has been um, highlighting it as well, we have gone beyond JN1. Um, which was um, the subsequent uh, version of the BA28.6. We then had KP1, then we had KP2, now we have KP3, and then there is LB1, and there is a KP2.3. Listen, this is pretty serious. So people are getting reinfected, but everybody's saying, well, I only had a mild infection. Well, let's get to the sands and see really what is going on. So here is the paper that I'm making reference to. This was done in Nature Medicine. It was published in November 2022. And they were looking, they were following in the Veterans Association. So it's a large cohort of people, um, about 40, 440,000 
um, people they were looking at with regards to infections, one, two or more. They looked at them with regards to vaccination status as well. So this was a huge study and one that was critically important with understanding some of the risks that exist. One of the, I'll tell you what I think is important. Here is a question that you need to think about. Everybody got frightened with COVID-19. It was a significant respiratory infection. People were getting sick, ending up in hospital on oxygen and dying, would say, within a month sometimes. For some people, it was faster. They were on intensive care. There was a lot of pressure on hospitals. People were very scared. Let's just imagine for a moment that instead of a severe respiratory illness that presented acutely, within about three months, people got sick and died in exactly the same numbers. Would it catch our attention? So the question is, is it really about deaths or is it the mechanism of deaths that frightened people? Is it the fact that it was promoted, the amounts of deaths? But that's the point with regards to COVID reinfection. Very likely, similar if not more deaths are occurring, but just in a different way. So let's just break down a little bit with regards to this paper here. So I've highlighted a, a few sections. Um, I highlighted that, firstly, the risks were evident regardless of vaccination status. The risks were most pronounced in the acute phase, but persisted in the post-acute phase at six months. Now, what that means is that they were noticing that risks existed for up to six months beyond the infection. And I'll show you in a little bit what that looks like when they broke it down in terms of the of the images. So this is this is what um, they look like when they compared it according to vaccination status. So this is about reinfection by vaccination status. So before infection. So what they have noticed here, so all cause mortality just means that it doesn't matter what the person died of. Everything is included. When they compare it, no vaccination, one vaccination, two or more vaccinations. So you have to remember this was part of 2022. It was in 2022. You can see here that actually the higher the vaccine, vaccine numbers, there seem to, because this is your baseline almost, the trend beyond the baseline, anything beyond this line indicates a higher risk. And if you roll down to the bottom here, you can see this is two times, three times, four times, five times higher risk. So as you go up to the top again, you can see that there is a slightly higher risk depending on the vaccination status. Now, when I think about storm, this is where um, the spike uh, triggered autoimmune response. That makes sense to me because in that sense, it's about immune system priming. And people, the more people have immune system priming, the more likely they're ha let to have autoimmune responses, which can then present in unusual ways. I think in terms of understanding the impact it has on the health service, so you have to remember that there is another wave at the moment in a lot of the Western countries. So this is how it's going to impact the health service. So when they looked at it, in terms of the acute and post-acute phases of reinfection versus no reinfection. Again, when they're looking at the outcomes here, all-cause mortality, hospitalization, at the bottom here is your baseline. Anything above this indicates higher risk. And so you can see as we go down here, they were counting it in terms of days, 30, 60, 90, 121, 50, 180 days. So they followed it up for quite a while. And when you look at it with regards to all cause mortality, you can see here that's whatever people died of. You can see that here within 30 days, it's an over three times, almost four times higher risk. It falls off by about 60 days, falling down and then flattens by about 60 months, um, about, about six months. What's interesting is that it doesn't come back to normal. And that's very, very important. And then when they look at excess burden per 1,000 persons, so this is looking at all-cause mortality, 
it's identifying that per 1,000 people in the acute phase, you could see about nine or 10 people dying per 1,000. By the time you reach the post-acute phase, it goes down. And the total is, I think, around close to uh, 20 per 1,000 that would die within about six months. And the trend tends to fall off. It's a similar issue with regards to hospitalization here. You're talking about per 1,000. It's about 45 per 1,000 in the first month. And so if you are having reinfections occurring now, as what's happening, you can expect that hospitalizations will rise in highly vaccinated regions by about late July into August. And then um, the trend will kind of ease off a little bit going into the winter. But then as the winter comes, if you have more reinfections, you then have another surge and it's wave upon wave that would occur. This is what I mean with regards to the storm surge is that it's not a tsunami. It's a wave. It washes up on your feet. It seems to pull out a little bit. Then it washes up again. It goes beyond you and it's coming up to your knee, pulls back a bit. Then another wave comes and it's at your waist. Before you know it, you are underwater. That's how this works in the context of a storm surge because the infections seem to be accelerating. Just as Gert had said, that there would be a rapid acceleration of variants until there is a variant that in just evades the immune system, and this would then have the mortality implications. The point, though, is that people keep on looking for severe COVID-19, lung disease where people are on oxygen. They say ICUs are not full. It will not present in the same way. And that is actually the most important point. So I'm going to show you the way that it will tend to present. So just look at what happens when they look at the outcomes. This is again from the paper. As we said here, all-cause mortality is elevated with reinfections. Hospitalization is significantly up. This is the baseline, remember, right here. This is hospitalization significantly elevated. At least one problem, one sequelae, one um, longer-term chronic issue, is significantly higher. So we're talking about almost a two times greater risk. Cardiovascular, so heart problems, coagulation problems, kidney problems, and lung problems are the highest risk with reinfection. Neurological problems seem to be less. Now, you have to remember this was in 2022. I suspect that if we looked at the variants now, this neurological problem would be going all the way up and some of the other ones would be sliding down. So this is not up to date in terms of the current variants. So the point is that every time there is a reinfection and the mistake is people think that it is every person. No, out of a thousand, you know, we're talking um, one to two percent. But when we look at the uh, impact that it has on the health service, in terms of the layering of these, these effects, it's absolutely huge. This is what causes hospitals to be completely overwhelmed when in the middle of summer, you would expect that there is no um, particular problem. Um, again, this we are showing with regards to vaccination status and no vaccination. It is less than with one or two. But I would caution people, again, to just presume that whatever someone's vaccination status, the challenge is to prevent reinfections. Um, what I have come to the conclusion of is that when, as we're trying to think about who is most at risk, and the way I look at it is that, firstly, if the virus penetrates your mucosal barrier, so it's not just about an infection, so it's not that's why not everybody who gets infected has a problem. It's about an infection that breaks into your bloodstream, what we call a viremia, where the virus is circulating in the bloodstream. That's where all the risk lies. So if most people have an infection, but it's only in their upper airway, they're fine. The question is, who is most at risk for the virus breaking into the bloodstream? And then even then, even if you had a serum viremia, 
the question is who is most at risk for autoimmune responses afterwards so my thought would be if you already had very moderate or severe covid that suggests that you had a predisposition for that kind of cytokine storm the risk in my mind analytically would therefore be higher in people who have had that situation because it indicates that their immune system could already overreact or had already overreacted. So that's older people, hypertension, diabetes, obesity. And so the challenge is about how do we protect against this next phase or this persistent wave of reinfections? That's the challenge. In reality, there is no easy way out. And maybe Gert is right. The only way that you can prevent the longer term impacts, whatever your vaccination status, is to just not be around people who are infected. That's not easy to do in environments that are highly vaccinated where we have high circulation of virus. You may find, well, Africa, of course, may be very, very safe um, because they're just not circulating virus. There's too many people have natural immunity. It's hard for the virus to break through that level of mucosal um, protection. And so we are coming to a situation where it seems as though the groups that had the lowest access to interventions early in the pandemic may come out the best. It's an inconvenient reality, but one that we certainly have to look at. What does it mean for each individual? I think that do whatever you can to try and prevent exposure. Now, some people don't like masks. That's their choice. My suggestion is that whatever you can do to reduce exposure, please do it. You know, um, antivirals, there is still no clear consensus from public health, so most people don't have access to anything. But make sure that you follow us with regards to the newsletter because very soon I'll be putting out what we call Disease X. So just remember to join us on the newsletter because I will then be trying to delineate some of the things, some of the strategies that could be used. One of the very simple ones is vitamin D. Make sure your levels are very adequate. And what I mean is not just above deficiency. Make sure it's well within range. Find out the top range, know what the bottom range is, get yourself in the middle. That is one of the simplest strategies that you can do to protect your immune system and also the immune responses that come from autoimmunity. Vitamin D is such a critical thing. So yes, we have a challenge ahead of us. Remember, as I try and delineate the science around storm, I predict that this is going to be the driver for the reinfection mortality that we are likely to see. It's not going to look like how it looked in the first part of the pandemic. It's going to look very, very different. Trying to figure out what we do and how we do it is still a huge challenge needs a lot of research, and we need the whole scientific community to pull together. Have a great evening. Thank you.